Okay, welcome again to another No Gi Required podcast. With me always, I have my my brother, my friend, my cousin, Mr. Jay Zibalos. Super excited about and this one today. He always brought his bodyguard, his brother Mike Zibalos, which is our do everything guy here. Without him, is no podcast at all. And uh, to me, is uh, incredible. Is so many people do have stories to tell, and uh, it's what. One of the main reasons we have that idea to have a podcast as i guess today i have a 20 years veteran officer sergeant eddie suarez how are you I'm, sir I'm doing well sir and it's incredible because uh, it's very hard for me to <clears throat> defer like him and his partner or his partner and him to me it became just one it doesn't work without each other and for you guys to understand his partner i want him to give us a little brief introduction to his partner to all of us well first of all thank you master john jock for having us it's a I mean, huge honor and professor jay please it's it's our honor yes, trust me thank you so my partner is canine duke he's a european doberman he just turned six and he is a certified narcotic detection dog man you guys it's i mean he, he looks scary and sweet at the same time but it's incredible of the kind of service that you do it's uh it's an amazing and through this time i also become a jiu-jitsu practitioner and people is now part of our family and jiu-jitsu with our uh, associated school in we call it redwood Peninsula Self-Defense, which I have also the pleasure to see the instructor over here, Mr. Eric Archer, sir. Thanks for being here. And um, let me start with this. When when did you become a police officer? So it's been about t a little over 20 years is when I started. Um, went through the academy and got hired with the city of East Palo Alto. Which did you ever dream <clears throat> to be a police officer as a kid? How has that path happened to your life? N never. You know, everybody is... Uh, you know, you hear the stories. I always, thought, always want to be. I never want to be a cop. I was, I was a tractor mechanic before for uh, John Deere, before I became a cop. And I was a mechanic for years and got some friends that were on the force and did a couple of ride-alongs. And the first ride-along I did, I said, "This is, what I want to do. <laughs> this is what I want to do." So um, went through the academy and got hired and uh, have had a wonderful career so far. And. And I was looking to some of the videos and uh, interviews that you had. And if I'm not wrong, and please do <clears throat> correct me, when when did you get your dog? So Duke is six, and I got him when he was eight weeks old as a puppy. And with no inclination that he was going to be a police dog. So my son was going away to college, University of Redlands, to play football. And... I needed somebody to fill that void. So I bought Duke at eight weeks old as a personal pet with no, no future of him being a working dog. Shortly after that, I was uh, given the opportunity to run a narcotics team and we didn't have a narcotics dog. Because I, when I saw something of you, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt you is, I saw that actually became was almost like a joke. Oh, we wish we have a canine dog here to help us or something. <laughs> And he was in the right place at the right, right time. Right. So it's it's a funny story, and, and I make fun of the chief at the time. Um, he was around five, six months old, and I had a meeting to go to at the police department. And uh, the chief was a huge dog lover, and he knew that I had a brand-new Doberman puppy. So he asked, Ed, where's, where's your dog? I said, well, he's in the truck. Now bring him in, I'll puppy sit for you. I said, okay, chief, you're the boss. So I bring him in. <laughs> the meeting ran really long, two hours. And I come back and puppy Duke is laying underneath his desk asleep. The chief's typing away and there's shredded cardboard all over his, his room <laughs> <laughs> and about five or six specific little wet spots. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, Duke peed all over his office. So I'm, you know, telling the chief, I'm extremely sorry. <laughs> My dog just peed all over your office and shredded up. And he's laughing. He says, no, we had a great time. And somebody else will clean it up. Don't worry. I said, man, you know, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm waiting for him to ask for my gun and badge, go be a fireman, you know? <laughs> so he's like, no, he's welcome anytime. And so I was still nervous. I made a joke. Wouldn't it be funny if he became a drug dog, if, if he was a part of our team? And he's like, he cocked his head to the side. He said, I wouldn't be opposed to that. So it dropped the seed in, in, in my mind, and we started training. We're doing detection work, and, and a buddy of mine owns a training place, Bay Area Canine. 
And we started working together with obedience and scent work, and it just grew from there. And, and finally, in June of 2016, um, he was ratified to be a police officer, and we got sent to school to to be partners. That's amazing. Yeah. I love the, the the fact that the chief of all people was just so <clears throat> just let him run loose and just let him be a dog. Yeah, and he he saw something in Duke and, and saw something in me. And and once the uh, another funny story is once he you know, we became. You know, it ratified. He said, okay, look, you're 6'4", and at the time I was 250, 255 pounds. I'm giving you a Doberman to walk the streets with you. You know, what's that going to look like with, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the reputation of the Doberman, you know, in the 70s, the Doberman gang where they rob a bank and all that stuff. So they, ha they have, you know, they can have a pretty bad looking exterior to where they're frightening. And then with you throw in a guy that's 6'4", with tattoos, what's the community going to think? So he said... Six months you're on probation. You got to go to every elementary school. You got to do outreach with the community to let them know that you're, you know, you're out there to help. He's not a bite dog. He's a detection dog. Six months you got to do that. You got to go to every school. And a little history. I mean, I I worked undercover and I worked out gangs with my whole, basically my whole career. I did not like being photographed. I don't like being interviewed. There's no way I would ever give a, a speech in front of you. But, the old me would never be here talking to you. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, I said, okay. I almost thought, well, chief, I don't want the job that bad. I won't do it. But I begrudgingly said, yeah, I'll do it for six months. Then after that, I'll never do it again. So I went to my first, it was a pre-K uh, little shindig that with the, with the kids. And I was in and I was sweating bullets and nervous and didn't know what I was going to say. And I went in there and, and I figured I'd talk for five, 10 minutes. I was in there for over an hour talking to these kids and when i left something snapped and said wow this this is something i could do and that six months turned into now five years of i go to schools and hospitals and the va and bring him you know to talk to kids and that's that to me finding drugs is great and getting gangsters and all that stuff off the but street that interaction with the kids with the and kids that's the that's, yeah. that's something that you know will last a lot longer than sending somebody to jail you know that the impact with that little kid or that sick person in the hospital leaps and bounds of, of what, you know, uh, the criminal justice system can do. Yeah, and, do. And, and I think I remember, like, at least my parents, they got a dog <clears throat> to give us, kind of develop some feelings, some more responsibilities to taking care of. And I think as uh, an officer go with a dog in the school, I, I'm sure the kids would love, especially the dog well-trained. Mm -hmm. It's not going to, you know, be a work. I'm sure because of you, a lot of kids went home, Mom, Dad, I need a dog. I want to have a dog. I want a dog like that one. Yeah. And, and so, that's just the start yeah. from there. Man, I know the field that you are in, they never call you for a party. They always call you, hey, something's wrong here. We got to find something here. I would like if you can, if you then you go through some situations that have been with Duke that you end up finding things that I don't think the bad guy was expecting mm -hmm. to or <clears throat> when was the first one, the first time actually you guys in action together mm -hmm. and I'm pretty much sure that is unforgettable. No. So the, the thing, the, well, the, the biggest one that stands out is we were working with an, another state agency that needed a narcotic dog and they called me in advance and it was a, it was a huge bus where there was going to be three houses and some businesses hit. And I was in charge of two houses and Duke and I were going to do the searching. So we got called and SWAT ended up hitting the house, clearing it. We go in and it ends up being a, uh, a Buddhist temple that the guy had made it into a Buddhist temple. It was a front. So Duke was, was searching around and he hit in three, four different locations behind a, a big Buddhist uh, uh, statue and then this huge safe. And Duke hit on the safe. And we ended up getting into that safe and there was just under an ounce of methamphetamine in there. But one point two million dollars in gold bars, <laughs> and the and, and the look at everybody's face when when we open up the safe, nobody cared about the drugs. We're looking at over a million dollars in gold bars. Well, I've never seen that much before. So we end up we seize that. You know, we turn that money into something good where we can use with with the kids and stuff. But then the guy ended up showing up, uh, the bad guy showing up, and he had probably another couple hundred thousand dollars of gold bars in his trunk and more drugs. But he had. Um, I don't know if he was trying to be slick, but he had steaks, uh, oh, raw steaks oh, around the back oh, to maybe gotcha. throw off dogs and stuff. 
well, that's not going to work. You know, uh, so you know, the look on his face when we're unloading the gold bars was priceless. It was like, oh my God. Yeah. I just lost everything. Oh my God. But that, that was one of the most memorable. I mean, how often can you say that you've, you seize over a million dollars in gold bars? You know, <laughs> this guy wasn't even a pirate. <laughs> and, and on that process, I know they call you for all kinds of, I don't know, at the airport. Also, you have, I'm sure you have some situations yeah. there that, so we go to um, a lot of like UPS, the post office, and a lot of times they're uh, drugs and money keep the exchange. So we're able to run the line and find uh, a lot of drugs and, and money coming back and forth. Um, one comes up where we did a search where the guy was trying to hide it in his uh in a Play-Doh box for in his kid's room, you know, and, and Duke ended up finding it. And nobody believed us that, you know, there was drugs there. They opened, you know, the other agents opened up, oh, it's just a Play-Doh box. We'll open up the Play-Doh box. When we open it up, there's $100,000 worth of drug money in there. So his nose is, is just, is phenomenal. And what, what in a way he's specialized in terms of drugs? What is his main thing so he he specialized and certified through the state of california for cocaine methamphetamine heroin marijuana and mdma which is ecstasy the pills man this is so incredible yeah. and it's <clears throat> and uh is there any of those situations that and I'm, I'm sure all of them are always we kind of expect something go wrong or any bus that you have to go that you have people maybe are expecting you guys or something, or the situation was already calm that allows you guys to let him do his work. So most of the time, when when we're called, um, it, the scene is uh, secured already. So SWAT or, or a, a, the agency has already gone in there, cleared, taken all the bad guys out, and I'll go in and I'll do a preliminary search to make sure there's no drugs out in the open because he can't, you know, when he's breathing in all that that air, um, he's breathing in whatever's on the ground or whatever's on a table so i'll do a preliminary search to make sure there's nothing out there that's going to harm him yeah, yeah. especially with the fentanyl craze that's going on right now but uh usually it's all it's all secure it's all secure we, yeah. ready and uh is there any kind of uh if they play do it i can't imagine it's like i do what is this and now that i know is um the the way the way that I see you and your dog, and I'm sure I I can relate to myself because I I love my dog. I have a dog too, and uh, I have a feeling that he's no longer a dog. He becomes literally part of our family to me as a person. Because I I look at his eyes, I I'm sure he understand how I'm feeling, and every day we get so attached to your dog. Let me ask you this. Um, When you start training jiu-jitsu, when was that happening and why that happened? Because uh, now that you, you're literally part of our family jiu-jitsu-wise, and when that actually happened in your life, when you felt, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to try this martial arts style, and when that happened to you, to be, become part of our family literally here? So I can tell you the exact date is um, October 27th. 2019. And the day before I had stopped by the academy and then um, Professor Eric, I had told him, you know, hey, can I come by and check it out? And there was a kid's class going on. So I brought Duke in. Oh, and let Duke, man. Let Duke oh, yeah. No longer the that class is on. <laughs> <laughs> so, and for years I've trained or I've, I've worked with people that have worked with Eric in jiu-jitsu and known Eric for over 20 years. And they've always been trying to get me into jiu-jitsu. And you know, I'm that. I was that typical guy that was. I, I don't need jujitsu. I'm. I'm pretty strong. I'll. Ju I'll just stand up and I'll smash you. To be you honest know? with you, it's my uncle used to say: if anybody over two hundred pounds, they don't need jujitsu. <laughs> yeah, we need jujitsu. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong on that one. <laughs> Nobody's gonna mess with you. They will mess with us. <laughs> so I finally, you know, getting old and you know, going to be forty-seven. I, I I can't stand up and fight with these young guys anymore. Let me let me call Eric and see if I can get a private. So I, I, I called Professor Eric and he said, yeah, come on by. And I did a private and within five minutes he had me in side control. And, you know, I, I'm a little bit bigger than Eric and he felt like a 300 pound man crushing me to death. And I tapped, I'm, I'll, I'll say it now, I tapped a pressure <laughs> to him that day. And, and some, I said, I need to learn everything he knows <laughs> because this is awesome. If this little guy can do this to me, I'm in trouble. And um, since then, I've been going five days a week, 
trained trained with him doing I started with private classes and, and you just and, did double gold yeah. which is amazing <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about that what what motivated you to want to compete um this this last time in in Houston was my second time I did uh, Jiu Jitsu World League first also took gold there and then um I'm a huge, uh, I like to be competitive and test myself and, and what better way can you see how you're progressing in, in the art and, and if, you know, it really works is to try to, to have a match with somebody that you don't know and you don't know their jiu-jitsu and, mm-hmm. and, and, and put Jean-Jacques Machado's <laughs> jiu-jitsu against whoever and, and it worked. And did you feel, I know it's still early, but I think it's jiu-jitsu has such an impact on our lives. <clears throat> what, what? What are you feeling now, like after training for a little bit, that has on you? I know, as I heard, you you already lost a lot of weight, which is something that mm-hmm. eventually happened to most of us. But what change did you feel doing jujitsu? What that has an impact on you and your relations with everybody else, and calms you down more, makes you more or less aggressive? How that impact to you? It- I like to look back and, and you hear everybody say, you know, jujitsu changed my, changed my life. Well, it improved mine tremendously to the fact that I'm, I'm in better shape than I have been in years. Um, I, I was a competitive bodybuilder when I was younger and I've always lifted and stayed in, in good shape. And I always saw, you know, the, the epitome of a man is, is, you know, a big muscular guy and he's strong. And, and I started to do jujitsu and I went from thinking that way to thinking, I don't need to be that big guy anymore. I can be 210, 215, 220 and still be strong and fit. And losing that weight before would have caused me like mental anguish. Oh man, I'm getting skinny. <laughs> now I care less. You know, I can be one second. Getting skinny at 220, man. <laughs> They're skinny. I'm not just bone. I'm just 180. Like I'm just skin and bone. <laughs> but just the, the, the camaraderie that, that we have at the school is is in law enforcement you're tight with your brothers and and and, and because you go through so much and th- jiu-jitsu to me is almost uh, better than than what i found even in, in law enforcement to where the that you're with these guys so much on the mat and you're bleeding with them and you're training with them and you're getting injured with them and you're going to competitions that you create a bond that yeah. is even better than some of the guys that I, I've worked with for 20 years in law enforcement. You know, it, it's, I think in life we, we can find in a way many families. I mean, we born in a house and, and a lot of people are fortunate to have mom and dad in the same house. A lot of people, just mom or just dad. And I think I end up realizing you know, if all these years that once we get into a jiu-jitsu school and it literally become a family because Many times we have bad days, we have good days, but we always have there the same people pushing you on your side in a good day, in a bad day. And it turns out to be that for me to achieve and improve, I need time. And suddenly you are spending one year, two years, three years, 15 years, 16 years. And in very few environments, we spend so much time with the same people surround us and they're real relationships Mm -hmm. that's the thing that we always we try to explain to people when they first come in one of the beauties of of the of the training itself is it is based on the fact that we're both going for the same thing but you are trusting me not to hurt you i am trusting you not to hurt me so you can amp it up you can pull it down and the people that you train with you develop as that trust builds your skill level builds you can push each other further and further and you know you're not going to hurt each other. And that translates off the mat when you're just talking with people. You, When you have that level of trust and, and the intimacy of the training, it's just you forge these deep relationships, like you said. And that's, for me, that's almost as important as the actual training itself, yeah. which leads to my question. Obviously, and I'm sure you haven't really mentioned it, but I think it goes without saying that it's probably helped you manage the stress of your job and all that coming in. 100%, especially over the last year with COVID and the lockdown and, and, yes. and, and Duke, and, and it, it's completely changed our job. So um, we can't do it like we used to. And, and the unit that I did supervise, our narcotic gang unit, has gone away. They, they basically took it away from us. So uh, I'm just in charge of our regular investigations, but I still utilize Duke and um, 
having a hard day um, this last year, there was a lot of them. Being able to go to jujitsu um, either during lunch or after work was a godsend. There was it was better than church, going to church. Um, being able to, to talk to Professor Eric every day on a text or calling him, um, you know, he probably got tired of, hey, can I, can I do a private? No, you know, he'll never get tired <laughs> of it. Never. I can tell but, you that right now. But just the the, the outlet to come and, and sweat and, 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 you know, leave it all on the mat for, you know, an hour and a half, two hours and, and leaving and, and leaving all your, your worries and, and your pain on that mat and to go home and, and, and the energy that you pass on to Duke is probably huge. Cause I was going to ask that. I mean, I would imagine there's a certain a level of stress yes. that he is, that he has to go through when he's on the job. Yes. How do you, how do you get him to, to unwind, so, run, run with him, throw wait. a gi on him? <laughs> I see pictures with him wearing the gi. I know. So do I. <laughs> he's wrestled with, with, you know. Yeah. He's, you he, he tapped me out. <laughs> yeah. And, and, to follow up on that, I think uh, that in Jiu-Jitsu, one amazing thing is this. When people walk into the mat, they cannot hide or lie about who they are. And that's one of the beauties. And that as as instructor can see the person's soul. It's very hard for people to hide if they're good, if they're bad, or stressed or nervous. That shows right into the Jiu-Jitsu. Which, as we train, we learn how to manage that better, lose more here, gain more there. It's uh, yeah, definitely, and that what one of the things that makes such a, a an amazing connection. Yeah, and and unlike law enforcement, to where there's a lot of ego in law enforcement, you got that the alpha male syndrome in law enforcement, and you'll get that 20, 30 year vet that will treat you know somebody that's only. You know, yeah, a week a week old in law enforcement differently. But going into to jitsu with with PSD and professor, I, I was treated the same as if I had already been there a year. Um, people treated me so kindly the first day, and although uh, my what was it my third day was no gi, and I had my rash guard on backwards, <laughs> and nobody said anything until afterwards. And one one guy comes like, "Hey, nobody wanted to tell you, but your rash guard's on backwards." <laughs> Other than that, it was awesome. <laughs> Look, it happens almost every new student. They put the gi and they put the pants backward. You see, when they tie, it's all different. <laughs> and, and then we approach. Um, it's the other way around. Oh, they you can you can see in their face like oh they're already nervous enough, you yeah. know. You want them you, you want them to feel comfortable, you want them to feel yeah. welcome. So you kind of just roll with it and just tell them in a nice way, hey, <laughs> come over here, you know. Let me ask you this, like when I go to teach a class, it's kind of a, a transformation once we're walking in, in our regular clothes and we put the gear on. It feels like something takes me. How is that work? with Duke, how does he know it's not playtime anymore, now it's we're in business, and the same thing for you, because <clears throat> it's a different environment mm. and something that you have to be in a focus in a way that turn it on and turn it off. How that works for you and for him? So I'll start with him. For him, when he, uh, when I go up to a scene, um, there's a sp certain toy that I use that I only bring out when it's time for him to search. And it's his favorite toy, and he goes nuts for it. So when he sees me grab that 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 ball, and I get a different leash, I, other than the leash that I use now, there's a special lightweight leash that I that I use, and I put it on his flat collar, and that triggers him, and he starts going nuts. He 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 doesn't want to do anything else, but I want to go in there and search because he knows if I find that 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 bad stuff, Dad's going to get me that ball. So I go in there, and he'll search. And uh, he does a, a passive alert, which is he just puts his nose and he gets rigid still. And I know that, that the, something, the, is there. something is there. So I'll throw the ball at him and he goes nuts. Take it away and we, we search again. So it's it's the equipment and then the feel. Because the, the, from day one, they always tell you that the anxiety and the excitement, everything that you're feeling runs down the leash to the dog. So if, if you're scared, if you have anxiety, if, or if you're unsure of yourself, your dog's going to feel that tenfold because he's so in tune with you. Um, so I, when I go someplace, I, I try and, you know, I get the call or if I already know that I'm supposed to be there at 6 a.m., you know, I'll meditate a little bit and just get myself in the mind right outside of him. To where I know when I grab him, I have a clear mind. I know the mission. And when I step out of the car, he, he doesn't feel anything but positivity that comes down, down the lead. 
And I think um, I'm sure, and I'm going to answer this. I I believe I already know the answer, but does he feel sometimes you are not in a good day, and he kind of trying to hey dad, come on, let's play, let's do this. One hundred percent. He being with you know other police dogs, they'll get them a, a year and a half, two years already trained. I was fortunately to have him as a puppy, so we're we have I think a stronger bond. So if I'm in a bad mood or or something's ticked me off or or you know he he can feel it and he'll he'll come up and he'll try and sit on my my lap or sit on my chest or you know nudge me until I I start petting him and and you know I use him. My chief says jokingly that he's my service dog <laughs> and, and keeps me calm so much you know, my complaints have gone way down over the years well they are they all are to a certain extent a comfort comfort yeah. animal you know yeah. and you can't teach that you know he he's my my unicorn my special dog um you know i've had dogs my entire life but i've never had one that's so uh, he has his own personality and, and i you know, if you would i like to share a story that oh that please please <clears throat> we Early in our career, we we had asked to go to the Stanford uh, Lucille Packard uh, Children's Hospital, and they do a lot of terminal ill and cancer work with kids. And we got asked to go. They can't leave the hospital if they have a playroom. We got asked to do a little presentation with Duke, so we went there and and uh, Duke did his thing, and we talked to the kids. And one of the nurses pulled me aside and said, "Would you come to the ward where they're bedridden and can't get out of bed?" I said, well, okay, I, I can, I can try. I've, you know, and I've told him, I said, I've never trained my dog to do what you're asking me. And I said, but you know, I'll, I'll try it. So we walked into this, this long corridor. It's kind of dark and all the kids are in the bed and they're bedridden. Some have terminal brain cancer. Um, <clears throat> so we went up to the first uh, little bed and, you know, I can still see it clear as day. He's a little 12 year old girl. And, uh, Duke, <clears throat> sorry. It's okay. good, man. Yeah. Look, uh, to me, to me, and and what you do and what you achieve to do with your dog, man. This is, I think, it's like you're born for such a thing. It's a mission that you have in life. I feel that I have my mission is make people feel better through jujitsu, and I can see you here that this is part of a mission now to make people feel better because every time you find something it's a life that's been saved and put yourself in those positions to help those kids i mean it's, you know, it's it, something that it's it, 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 it you realize now that is a mission for you to continue yeah. to do what you do so well and and i don't believe in coincidence i don't yeah. believe you get this dog by coincidence oh it's an accident no it's something that has a purpose too yeah. and this is one off yeah and, and he he jumped on her bed and and snuggled up to her and she was petting him and and talking to him very softly and i was in awe and and i looked up and all the nurses had stopped and they were watching him and he stayed there for a good 10 minutes and the only time he would move was to snuggle up close to her and and, and pet and it was like i didn't train him to do that he knew that she was uh in need of something at that moment and he mm -hmm. gave it to her and that's something and that changed me um tremendously you know physically um spiritually and just th knowing that my dog helped her yeah um, and then you know said a little prayer for her she she said you know i love you duke and and we left and we hadn't seen her ever but it was something that i'll always remember with my partner and and man it, it's those things sometimes is um pass and not many people realize how hard it is to do what you do and see that what you do is for better. Because a lot of people sometimes see the law enforcement as something as a threat. And no, you guys are saving and you guys are giving hope. And that's what you, if your dog, are doing. Just the fact you're going to a lot of schools and kids see that and change completely the way we see and feel towards the law enforcement. Yeah. That is amazing. And I'm sure he's, he's a special dog. But you're a special guy too, because it's no one, you guys complement each other in a way that very challenged to find Thank like you. that, because you have a dog s since a puppy. And like you said, most of the dogs are ready year and a half. Then they find a partner. You guys are in this together since day one on baby steps. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's wonderful is how you just said that, you know, when you got him, the idea of talking in public, the idea of 
doing the things that you were like, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm not built for this. Yeah, and, I mean, and he transformed you. His, yeah. di- his teaching you know? is he's, something. He's taught me so much yeah, over the years to know? where he's opened me up to, to, you know, I'm here with Master Sean Fox and Professor Jay. Oh, no. <laughs> Who would have thought? I would have never thought in a million years that I'd be sitting here today and have done the things I've done with him with, you know, being on TV shows, being, you know, Duke having his own movie and, and working with other other people. I would have never done that. And the, the things that he's provi- opened up for me, it's just, I, I can never repay him for what he's done. Man, if people don't know, he has, I don't know, over 100,000 followers on his Instagram. Oh, I'll just say, like, I, do, I follow him. It's like, we, man, you know, when I we want to see his adventures. When we had the Malibu <laughs> school, we had all kinds of actors rolling in, wanting to train and teach. And you accommodate everybody. I'm not a picture guy. I'm just not. I mean, there are a couple of jujitsu people. If I see them, I'm like, oh, I got to get a picture. But nobody. But when I went up to, <laughs> to Peninsula, I'm like, oh, Duke, I kind of dropped everything. Picture, Mark, hold my camera. I had to do it, you know. Oh, it's amazing. Now, kind of a, a little, because I follow you, obviously, on social media and Facebook, and something you posted recently is kind of, I just want to draw attention to it, because I think it's an amazing organization. I've been doing a little reading into it. You partner with a company called um, Project Canine Hero? Yes. This is pretty cool, John jock This, like, because eventually Duke is going to Can I retire. sign up my dog onto this, Mr. Uh, Fuzzy Wuzzy? I don't know. <laughs> He's not that fan. He's a cool dog, but... <laughs> I'll, let Ed, I'll let Ed describe the program more, but I think I think it's wonderful what they're doing. So um, I partnered a couple of years ago with Jason um, for Project Canyon Hero, and what he does is once um, a dog, whether through the military or police, is retired, uh, depending if it's injury or age, um, Usually the handler will buy the dog from the police department, and it's usually a dollar. They just have a contract, give us a dollar, boom, the dog's yours. But then they're responsible for all medical bills for that dog. And you're talking about a dog that's had, you know, a rough life. If it's an yes. apprehension dog, it's, it's got a lot of bites, it's got broken teeth, you know, broken bones. So that handler were, uh, is responsible for that dog once they separate ties with the police department. So it can go, you know, a surgery can go in from a thousand, a ten thousand, fifteen thousand. Oh yeah, dollars I know. Easily. Yeah. yeah. So what Jason does with Project Canyon Hero is he adopts these dogs uh, and the handler and picks up the entire medical bill for that dog. And he's got, I want to say over 140 teams that he works with that he pays a hundred percent of their medical bills. Usually, usually how long, I'm sure it depends the actions of the dog, but usually how long that dog stays in the law enforcement. Usually it's there anywhere they will tire anywhere from seven to 10 years. Um, because especially with, if it's a dual purpose where it's detection and apprehension when they're biting, that's a lot of stress on the dog. Um, over the years, um, mentally and physically, and, and they'll and milit- military and working dogs, they get the same PTSD that that, yeah. that officers and soldiers will, will get. Um, so there's a lot of care that happens with the dog after their service life is done. So what Jason does is he he takes in and alleviates that stress from from the the handler that that dog's going to be taken care of. And no, no, you know, it's all a 501c3 and a couple of products that we sell, the, the, the proceeds go to help them. And he, he just has, you know, he's prior police, he's prior military, so he knows, and he's a prior working dog handler, so he knows the, the stress that, that goes with having to, to do that once they're retired. And, and usually um, when the dog work in, um, as, a, as a police for law enforcement, is when the day is gone, job is over, usually he goes home with his partner. Yes. He be, literally become basically 24-7 partner. Yeah. There's no switching partners for the dog or anything. Sometimes, um, whether if the handler promotes to a sergeant or he goes to another department and that dog's young enough, they'll recycle that dog to another handler because some departments, they see it as a tool. It's, it's just like having a vehicle or, or a gun. It's something that, that the PD sees as, as a tool. And they put a lot of investment, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to train these dogs. Um, but most of the times when, when they are reach their age or where they're ready to retire, they will give it to the, the handler for that for that $1 fee. In, yeah, because I remember, I'm, I don't recall how many years ago, but I have a, a law enforcement police officer here, which he was a canine. He had a Germany chapter for quite some time and when the dog retired in his case he took the dog home it's like man this is 
is mine. He's my family. Yeah. I gotta take care of him. And it's most common that the partners start together and they end up together and, and after together, work. You know. It's it's amazing. Yeah. And that that bond, it's you know, it's hard to separate. Yeah. That, oh yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's that's he's connected to you. Yeah. You know, you can't just turn him away. Yeah. No and, way. and he. There's not many places that I go that he doesn't go, you know, and if I get invited to some place and they're like, well, you can't bring Duke. I'm not going. I'm not yeah, going. Sorry. Yeah, I'll yeah. see you next I'm the time. Same way. <laughs> do, do you know what I did for the first time? And I don't know why. And I just felt with this whole past year that stay home and all these very strict situations that we, we went through and still going through. Um, I look at my dog and he, when I have to leave to go to the supermarket or something, he's like, you know what? I'm going to take him with me. And now more often than ever, <laughs> my kids go, Dad, leave the dog home. And no, no, he's come with me. I need somebody to go with me. And 99% of the places, they have no problem. And, and my dog is really so well behaved. But yeah, it's uh, like you, I have such an attachment with my... If you, if you watch TV, like we don't watch much live television. We watch the news, of course, stay in tune. But you know, my wife and I marvel at it. Normally you, you kind of TiVo everything and you fast forward. I would say probably two thirds of all commercials involve a pet. Yeah. And the one that I remember, and I always, my it drives my wife crazy, but I'm like, I just, I will watch this commercial over and over. And it was, it was basically, it was almost like somebody witnessed your story in the, in the hospital because it, the commercial is the little girl and her mom is sitting by her bed and the nurse walks in and she's like, I can't do another treatment. I'm just not feeling it. And she goes, no, we're gonna do something a little different today. And you see her face light up, and the service dog walks over and puts his head on her chest. And yeah, I saw that. Oh, I watch that yeah. over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah. You know, but that's they're just part of our life. Yeah. You know, I you see an animal, and it's like it just calms you. Yeah, I mean the, the the service dog community, the 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 work that they do is just tremendous. I mean, dogs. We don't even know yet what they can do. Oh, they mm -hmm. they save lives, man. Dog is part of our <clears throat> history, and uh, we have. Um, one of our guests in podcast was uh, Brandon, Brandon yeah. McMillan, yeah, and he he trained dogs to be mm -hmm. companion dogs to people that come from war or kids that have some um, issues, and the dog is just their partner, yeah. do all those yeah. things. That's yeah. amazing, and that, what the dogs can do that people don't realize. Yeah. Yeah. That's you know, and the great thing about having you know our social media exploded is to be able to. To interact with more kids through social media and we and we've gotten some you know some great followers to where i've given my number to the, the kids and the parents and they text and you know um we have a great friend you know called axon jackson and he's got a service dog chase and uh we became good friends with his friends and they live in san diego i'm in northern california we talk we meet up but you know his dog his service dog helps him tremendously and you know i would have never met him if it was for duke and likewise mm -hmm. and and just meeting the kids via either schools or social media um it's amazing what dogs can do and i've seen some service dogs do some it's almost like things. the dogs have a play date then you're just coming along <laughs> yeah, yeah. hang out yeah, with the family yeah. most of the time they don't remember my name it's just oh it's duke and the guy that yeah, yeah. brings duke exactly <laughs> But I know your name. <laughs> when I showed my wife the pictures, I'm like, "Look, look, look! That's Duke." Like, okay, well, who, 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 who did he just roll in? No, no, no. His um, Ed. That's yeah, that's it, what Ed. <laughs> Ed, like going through all these years in uh, law enforcement, and amazingly have a partner like Duke. Um, how would you describe Sergeant Ed Suarez, or just Ed Suarez, as a person? Mm. You know, I've listened to all your podcasts, and I know you answer that. You ask that question. You know, that still, one, anyone yeah. that comes <clears throat> in, you can expect that. I want to hear from your own words. You know, now I've trained so much in my life. Now I'm still. I've reverted. I was that short little fat kid growing up that was that used comedy to to break the ice and to keep from getting picked on and all that stuff. And I think I've reverted back to that that little short fat kid that was just. Uh, humor and just guys being, you guys gotta watch in the channel because he's not yeah. fat at all <laughs> and, and or short a big guy and has a, a big dog next to him <laughs> you know, i just like to be goofy you know and I, I spent so many years uh being that alpha guy and being the that undercover that that narc and that that gang guy that you know yeah persona of being 
the biggest, baddest guy in the room. And I just don't want to be that guy anymore. And I would rather be the, the goofy, the, the spontaneous, the, the, you know, cracking the jokes and being the, the funny guy in the room, you know, than anything else. So, um, I'm, I'm just that goofy guy. I don't want to be serious anymore. I want to be here with you guys laughing and talking about funny stuff and doing jujitsu and, and, and let somebody else be that tough guy. There you go. Are you going to ask a question again? You have to ask the question again. Yeah, go ahead, Jay. Who is Duke? Duke's the superstar. I mean, he, he's, he, he, um, I just ordered a patch the other day that, that says I'm a black belt in shenanigans for Duke. <laughs> so he, 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 he's changed my life and, and he's, he's a superstar, um, just in my mind to where he's changed me. I mean, I don't even have a word to, to explain to you what, what he is. He's, he's my unicorn dog. I mean, he's, he's the one in a million changed me for the better. And man, I think it's a it's it's an incredible thing because it's very hard to to mention you without him or mention him without you. That becomes one a connection that you have, which is something very rare. The way you guys develop that friendship, and at least I don't see it, a lot of people that I met that work with dogs having that amazing bond that you have. But definitely watching all the things and. Um, you are in a mission, and, and every time he finds something, his people's lives being saved. As I just imagined, the distribution of all those narcotics, and he finds those things, it's one or maybe several people that would not have access to such a thing that sure. could harm them. And and you've been saving lives for quite some time, sir. And Duke, too. I mean, you are like him, superhero, <laughs> on, on, on our view, for sure, because what you've been doing and uh, not many people realize that's a lot of law enforcement guys that are saving lives the way you do if you are with duke and i uh, please do continue to do that do continue to be this goofy guy and make everybody <laughs> smile and laugh over here and uh, yes it's incredible because every time i go and see his instagram i always bring a smile on my face yeah, he's too. wearing the gi or he's doing something <laughs> funny but we know down deep that he's been saving lives with you and uh yes please continue to do so uh it's actually our honor to meet you and oh, thanks for all the service that you've been doing all this years uh keep doing that for many more years and uh welcome to our jiu-jitsu family and it's incredible man it's uh, our honor to meet you ed and uh thank you for being here with us today yeah, thank man. you very thank you. much any way you can get him to bark for our listeners let me wake him up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh is he getting camera shy come on up up come on, up No. <laughs> did you guys, did yeah, you guys you heard him you smelling hear the, the mic? You can hear the breathing. Yeah, you should see his face, man. Oh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> man, that is awesome, man. It's... Yes. Beautiful boy. Well, thank you once again, Eddie, for being was, here. And, uh, it thank was you. great, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for giving us great jujitsu. <laughs> man, it's uh, thank you, Professor Eric Archer, to bring this gentleman and his dog here for us to, to have this great time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ed.